coordination, government agency coordination, planning, designing construction of the North Dakota flood diversion projects. Talking about team approach, success. Today we have two incredible presenters. They're both registered engineers, pillars in the community, revered, recognized experts in not only North Dakota, but in the region. They're focused individuals that that understand the art of significance beyond personal and company success, but that art of significance, the, the long lasting, the legacy projects. Understanding a stronger, more resilient region means a better gross domestic product as Governor Burgum shared with us yesterday. So please help me welcome two unbelievable engineers, Jason Benson, Cass County engineer, and Chris Bakigard, the Director of Engineering for Metro Flood Diversion Authority, and learn about planning, design, construction of North Dakota flood diversion. Please help me welcome Jason and Chris. All right. Thanks, Dale. All right, good morning. Great to be here, and it's great to be on the stage with uh, Chris. He and I went to college years ago together, and then over the years, we've been able to work on a few projects. So when he got hired on as the director of engineering for the diversion project, I was super excited, and it's great to be working with him uh, on a daily basis on, on a diversion project. I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about project collaboration and kind of roll into a lot of the details on the diversion project itself. So when we, when we talk about project collaboration. We've got a lot of partners out there. We've got a lot of neighbors, uh, neighboring entities and agencies, and we need to get them on board with why we want to collaborate on a project, why we want to work together. And we need to get them to say yes. And that means not just our partners, but our elected officials. So those electeds are really important um, as, we, uh, as we move forward in collaborating together. And so we got to start with why, why is it important? So when we look at the efficiencies that we can gain by collaborating on projects, the cost savings, reduction in detour time and project time, these are all critical to making a more efficient, more effective, uh, cheaper project. And who, who doesn't want that? All of our electives want that. All of our taxpayers want that. So in, in the end, it just makes common sense that we work together instead of all trying to do our own thing um, if we can work collaboratively. So we need to think strategically, think beyond our project limits, think beyond our right of way. Who else can benefit? Um, you know, when it comes to strategic planning, looking at, you know, not just at next year's construction, two, three, five, 10 years out, what are the things that you need to do and what are your partner agencies, your neighboring agencies, what are they doing at the same time? Because if you're doing some bridge or box culverts or asphalt overlays in the corner of your county and there's a neighboring city that's looking at doing a similar project in about the same time frame, it's probably cheaper to have one contractor come in and do that type of work in, in that area in one year versus spreading it out over two or three years on smaller projects that are all gonna cost more. And then, you know, the traveling public, they don't care whose road it is. If, you know, with one of my county roads uh, and an interstate overpass, if they're going on the county road and then they hit the, the edge of the interstate right away, and then maybe the, the road surface changes, they get up and over the interstate, then they're back on the county road, they have no idea that that went from county to, inter or to DOT back to county road. They just know that, one segment was smooth, one was rough, doesn't make sense to them. So if I'm out there paving on that, why wouldn't I wanna to talk to my DOT district and say, how can we collaborate and, and maybe patch up a few things when we've got a contractor out there? So it's, it's all about making sure, you know, the traveling public, those taxpayers, they're gonna, uh, they're gonna weigh in with your electives as well. And so we wanna keep them happy. Uh, you know, on the smaller scale, some of the things that we've done in Cass County to collaborate, to save money. Uh, this example in 2014, 
Um, so we had a three mile segment of road that was within the city limits of Fargo and West Fargo. We were turning that county road over to those city, uh, to the two cities. And we had 900,000 allocated to do an asphalt overlay so we could hand it over to them. Through our discussions with MetroCog, the city, the two cities, the DOT, we really decided that the best use of that 900,000 was not just to throw some new asphalt on it, hand it over, and then three to five years later, have the cities rip it up and put down a new road. Instead, let's use that 900,000 plus some other resources to build a better road. So we put down a three lane concrete using county funds, uh, uh, federal funding that we were able to get through the DOT and as well as uh, MetroCog and then uh, the city. And we were able to get a much better project. And again, that $900,000 in county funding was able to build something much bigger and better than just an asphalt overlay. In 2023, we've got a, a huge project coming up down in the, the southwest part of the, of the metro. Uh, it's kind of our last stretch of 52nd Avenue that's been our county road for years. It used to go to, to the Red River and over the years we've collaborated with Fargo to turn over those segments. And we're at that last kind of critical uh, crazy connection point where we've got a county road bridge that needs to be replaced. And underneath the county road bridge is a dam that holds back water for the water treatment plant to be able to get water off of the Cheyenne River uh, over to Fargo's water treatment plant. So it's an intake site. Um, we also you know, need to rebuild uh, or add, add on some lanes to the uh, roundabout. So we're doing all that collaboratively. Sure, as the county, I could go in and just replace that bridge with what I think is necessary and turn it over to Fargo and West Fargo. But that's not going to get a great prog project and it's not going to get something that's going to be long lasting uh, like with us collaborating together. So, you know, as we look at projects, we wanna make sure we look at, you know, who's gonna take lead on these projects. You know, as the public entity, you know, when I'm doing work with, whether it's Horace, uh, Fargo, West Fargo, even some of the rural cities, uh, water resource districts, you know, who's gonna take the lead on that project? Who's gonna be uh, the person that's gonna be consolidating all the information and whether it's on the design end, the construction management, the funding, you know, how that, how's that funding mechanism gonna come together? Because again, um, as we find, uh, as we do more collaborative projects, we're gonna find savings. So we wanna make sure that those savings also get rolled out equitably to the different entities that are, that are helping to fund a project. And then who's gonna take the lead on the permitting and regulatory? And, and again, the importance on this stuff is that you need to get going early on and have these discussions early on, because if you've already sent out and had your consultant um, run down a lot of permit, permitting and regulatory, and then you decide to bring another entity to collaborate on this project, if you're having to go and redo a lot of that permitting effort, um, you're just wasting money. So if you can bring them in early, uh, you can save a lot uh, a lot on just that, uh, that administrative work. And then, you know, it's, it's all about teamwork. On any of these collaborative projects, when you're working together, it's about communications. It's about collaborating and throwing different ideas, not being afraid to, to you know, throw out different ideas. And then you have to stay positive. You have to stay, you know, in that we mentality. As soon as you start down the road of, they want this, we don't like what they're doing, they, they, you know, you gotta keep that we attitude, keep the team attitude, and you can build a great project. And as you're doing your initial scoping on a project or just your long-term planning, you know, three, five, seven years out, think about who else can benefit. You know, if you're doing a project through town, and, uh, through a smaller town, and it's part of a, you know, a county or a DOT project or whatever, you know, is there, is this, could the city benefit by something that you're doing? Um, because no one wants to find out that, hey, we were gonna hire a contractor to come and do some patching. We had no idea that the county or the state was gonna do an asphalt overlay on this stretch of road until the sign went up or the paver was getting loaded up off the truck. And then we realized, you know, we, we could have coordinated that and, and had that same contractor do some of the work right adjacent to, to the project. A, 
Over the years, uh, just in the last 10 years in red are all the different collaborative projects that we've done. Uh, one of the different agencies I've got listed is the water resource districts. I, I don't have all of the those with red stars because we work with them very closely in Cass County on a lot of uh, bridge and smaller structures on the on legal drains. But we work together with a lot of different agencies and entities, including, you know, shows the, the fairgrounds, the uh, um, Therals and ethanol. So there's been a lot of collaboration, not just with other government entities. And we've got a number of projects just planned in the next year here uh, or, or two years. And then of course, all the blue are the uh, different various projects that we've got going on uh, in Cass County is with the diversion. I've been uh, the county engineer for 11 years now. And that whole time I've been dealing with different diversion related projects. Um, you know, which really started uh, coming out of the 1997 flood. So in 1997, um, they started the South Side Flood Protection Plan. And then in 2006, that led to a greater uh, Corps of Engineers uh, concept uh, and study. And then in 2009, uh, February 2009, the Metro Flood Committee was formed. And then surprisingly, you know, uh, two months later, the flood of record happened with uh, 2009. And really the synergy and the, and the collaborative effort that helped save Fargo as we work together as a community, as a, as, as a larger community, including Fargo, Moorhead, West Fargo, and the smaller communities, all of that energy really helped drive that collaborative effort for the for what we've got now with the diversion project. Um, that led to 2011 in having the uh, flood diversion uh, board uh, uh, built. In 2012, the uh, record of decision came from the Corps of Engineers, as well as a partnering agreement that we were able to sign. And then we were able to pass a flood sales tax, both in Fargo and in, in Cass County to help fund the diversion project. In 2015, with the P3, you know, at the time, we didn't know how we were going to get this project done. So the, the overall concept for the project was a traditional core-led, core-designed bid build. So that was going to be between 13 and 20 different segments. All of them were going to be designed, then bid out, then built. And we estimated it was going to be using that same process probably 15 to 20 years to construct the project. Instead, um, we went, moved forward uh, with that P3 concept, which is, you know, we'll be talking about a little more in the presentation, and that's gonna get us a faster project at a, at a much cheaper cost. In 2017, we ran into some issues with the project, um, uh, especially on the Minnesota side, and we had um, uh, Governor Dayton from Minnesota and Governor Burgum come together and uh, I was fortunate to be on that governor's task force. It was interesting as the only technical person on that um, out of the 12 members, you know, and, and the only person that had been on the project for a long time, as far as understanding the uh, whys and why nots on all these different uh, concepts that had been kind of brushed aside because they weren't feasible. Uh, so it was, it was great to be able to walk away from the governor's task force with a, a, new, um, a new concept a workable plan that was going to be permitted not only on the North Dakota side, but on the Minnesota side, which led to the 2018 Minnesota DNR permit, which really was the last kind of linchpin uh, permitting piece that we needed to get done. Um, and then uh, just recently, now we've, you know, in the last legislative session, we locked in all of our state funding. The P3 team was selected last fall, and we ended up picking up some additional federal funding so that we're fully funded. Uh, so it's been a great, uh, great collaborative effort over the last, you know, really uh, 20 years as we've gone through from the South Side Flood Protection Plan to the developing the, the Flood Committee, the Metro Flood Committee, the Diversion Authority, all the way through the P3. So the Diversion Authority itself is just a collaborative effort in the fact that we've got members from, you know, Cass, uh, Cass County, Clay County, Moorhead, Fargo, West Fargo, and the Joint Water Resource Districts. So we've got a lot of entities and a lot of players that we have to work with uh, on a regular basis. 
at this point, I'll turn it over to Chris and, and uh, have him talk through some of the other agency uh, collaboration. Thanks, Jason. And like Jason, I'm certainly happy to be here today. Uh, it's kind of like a coming home party for me. I spent a good share of my career working in the transportation industry. Um, just recently transitioned into the Metro Flood Diversion Authority. Uh, been uh, excited about this size of a project. Um, really, like Jason, I was happy to be back and collaborating with, uh, with a lot of folks that I worked really closely with over many years. Um, but I want to take a few minutes here before we get, I'll give you guys some project updates. I know people are curious about kind of where we are and what's happening, but um, in the spirit of the theme of the conference here to the collaboration and coordination part, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about the scale of the project and the collaborative efforts that have been going on. Like Jason said, the entire concept of this project is, is collaboration. It, it's a huge project, um, certainly the largest project that I've ever worked on. So just, you know, again, with, you know, Jason teed up the Diversion Authority and, and how it's formed. Um, our main partner on the project is the Corps of Engineers. Uh, the project is technically a federal project. Um, we are the local uh, non-federal sponsor. Uh, but then as you, as you layer out, um, you know, we've, we're, we've worked with many different federal agencies, state agencies, local entities. I think we're at... Boy, when all said and done, we'll have 70 separate agreements um, related to the project with utility companies, with local entities. Um, we are working towards having a memorandum of understanding or an agreement with every entity that the project touches. So every township, every city, um, the DOT is, uh, we've got two different agreements with them. So we've just spent a collaborative effort all along at, at all levels to keep the project uh, moving forward and also to keep everybody um, connected and, and understanding what the project is. So you guys just got done with a session on utilities. Um, I, I thought I'd just put a little tidbit in here about again, the scale of the project. Um, we have 20 unique utility companies that we're working with that comprise nearly 200 different utility adjustments. Uh, some of those have been completed, but many of those will be kicked off here this spring. Um, and then on, on the flip side, when you think about the other side of the preliminary work, the permitting, again, we've got 30 different agencies that we've, we've obtained or will obtain permits from, um, ranging from the federal permits that we're all accustomed to down to state and local permits. Um, a couple of permits that I really wanted to highlight today are some of the unique um, permitting that we've done related to the P3. Um, in North Dakota, We've not done a lot of P3 projects in general. Um, there are some done on the private side, but not so much on the public side. So many of the public agencies really didn't have their processes set up to accommodate a, a P3 type delivery project. Um, so one example, we, we've been working with the North Dakota Department of Water Resources for obviously throughout the entire project on many different levels. But again, we needed two different permits for them. We need a permit to build a channel. We need a permit to build our Southern embankments. Um, well, the issue is on the, with the P3 delivery, there are no plans at the point when we needed the permit. So we worked with the Department of Water Resources. We were able to obtain a permit from them based on our technical requirements and, and explaining to the department what the project would look like, how it would be built, how it would be constructed. Oops. Technical difficulties here. Um, and so we were able to secure a general permit from them through a thorough review with them of the technical requirements. And then what happens now is we also set up a process with them that as we brought our P3 developer on board, uh, we developed a flow chart and a, and a process to then integrate the P3 team into the permitting process. So they now are, are in, the, in the process of developing two main design documents that will also be submitted to the Department of Water Resources. They will review those and those two sets of reviews essentially replace the, I think we've got somewhere around 1300 different design submittals that we'll be processing here in the next few years. And instead of running every one of those submittals through the Department of Water Resources, like we typically do, um, we've narrowed that down to where they will review our TRs, they'll review the design report, and then they also will, will get a copy and review our final plans for each segment of the project. 
And I think it's just a good example of both the state agencies and, and our local group collaborating again to develop a process for something that was very unique. Um, you know, and another example with the Department of Water Resources and with the Minnesota DNR, um, they're jointly permitting many of our Southern embankment components. So they've each issued an overarching permit. And then as each segment comes online, we get phased approvals from them that just verify that we're staying within the bounds of the original permit language. So one other unique feature of collaboration and, and just to kind of, again, to, to document the size and complexities of the project overall, um, this project will have what's called an adaptive mitigation and management plan. And uh, that plan was, was laid out in the NEPA documents and then required by the two state permits. But what, what ended up happening here is, is, you know, like if you look at the north-south axis, you know, typically what we have on projects is we document impacts that we have to the environment. Uh, we develop a mitigation plan, we do that mitigation, and then we basically just move on with our project and the agency moves on with their resource management. You know, so we interact with them directly. We come up with a, hey, we have so many acres of wetlands we need to mitigate, we mitigate those. Well, the issue here on, on our project is there were many, there were several, four, I'll explain them here in a minute, um, areas where it wasn't clear if there were going to be impacts by the project or not. It didn't appear to be based on the modeling and all the studies that were done, but there were still a lot of questions left in the resource agency's mind of, we're not sure that it, that it really is gonna perform that way. So we're setting up a, a process to adaptively manage and, and monitor the project. And if, if we hit a trigger as we establish, then, then we have a mechanism in place to how we would then adapt our project or perform some additional mitigation in the future to keep our project within compliance. So, so the kind of to dig in a little bit, you know, just to give you a little bit of a background. So these are the typical mitigation projects and, and we're in the midst of doing those. Um, like I said, we have 1500 acres of wetlands roughly that we need to mitigate. Um, we've been able to mitigate that primarily within our project limits. So we're building wetlands into our channel construction. Um, we've constructed two separate wetland mitigation projects as a part of our southern embankment projects to help mitigate the wetlands we're impacting. Uh, we've also have bought a few credits in areas where we have some unique wetlands that we just didn't have the ability to replace um, within our project limits. Again, we're, uh, we need to replace some trees that we're, that we're disturbing along the riverbanks. So we've been working with the county and the city and other agencies that have purchased different developments throughout the years of flooding and we're reforesting some of those areas to help replace that. Uh, we're also building some trees and some foresting into our channel plan to help break up the landscape a little bit. Um, and then the, you know, the two aquatic habitat and aquatic connectivity, that's really just to acknowledge that as we build our control structures, we're modifying the natural rivers. So we've just been working with the agencies on how do we mitigate and reestablish the natural channel as best we can. So when you get to the more unique features, and these are the ones that we're, we just have agreed, we're gonna monitor these. Uh, we've, we've been meeting with a team of resource agencies for the last couple of years, actually working through this. We just approved this plan um, late last fall. Um, so they've been collecting some data, um, some baseline data for the last uh, six, seven, eight years uh, along the rivers, just to monitor kind of how it's performing today. So they'll take some measurements after we have a higher, higher flow spring to kind of see what the river migration does. Probably the biggest, the biggest item that was left a little bit uncertain is the, is the top one, the geomorphic. And for those that aren't geomorphologists in the room like me, that basically just looks at, is the river eroding or sediment, you know, is there sedimentation going on? So how is the river changing? And we all know rivers naturally change over time. Uh, especially in the wet cycle we've been in for those that live along rivers, you know they change. So we're trying to monitor what change is natural and just part of the river evolution and what change might be caused by the fact that we're now running different, the water differently through the system with our project. So the, the resource agencies have their experts come in, uh, they meet with, with our team. Um, so they've developed what they call triggers. So we have a predetermined um, set of standards that we look at. And if, if we hit any of those triggers, then a group comes together, they talk about what, what's going on, what's happening. 
they make recommendations and back to the diversion authority on how they would, how we could address that issue and, and keep the project within the permit compliance overall. Um, and then, you know, the few others, um, the water quality and fish stranding is, is kind of a unique one too. Obviously when the rivers flood, there's a chance that fish kind of get out on the landscape and can't get back to the river. Um, so in, in this case, what we've looked at is are there areas that we are flooding with our project that typically don't flood and then the resource agencies have focused on those areas to see if we inadvertently push fish out into those areas and they can't get back to the rivers. And then we would, again, same process, we'd work through them as experts on developing either additional channeling or things that we could do to help keep, keep the fish that do get out onto the landscape, get them back into the rivers and keep, them, uh, keep that resource um, working well. And one of the unique features of the project, uh, we do have two what we call aqueducts that we're building with our channel. And so we've got uh, the Cheyenne River and the Maple River. I've got some photos here that I can show. Everybody's curious about what those look like in a minute. But uh, we basically have a situation where our channel will carry water underneath the level of a river that flows over top. So we've got a, basically a, a bridge structure, if you will, that carries the river water over the top and our diversion channel water underneath. Uh, there's a lot of questions about whether those man-made channels that carry the river waters in and out of uh, West Fargo and Fargo, whether those will allow fish passage. So we've had a, a lot of in-depth conversations about that with agencies. We've put a lot of effort into that to try to build that project with as much natural features as you can when you're building a large concrete structure. So that's another one that we need to monitor over time and just make sure that we're staying within the bounds of of providing adequate fish passage uh, along our, our river systems. So real quick, before I give you a general project updates, Jason and I sat down and looked at the overall project and thought, let's, let's maybe bring a couple of areas of the project uh, more into focus on, uh, on some of the collaboration and coordination that's going on inside this mega project. Um, this is an area, if you're, if you're familiar with the Fargo Moria, this is the north end of our channel. It's where our channel intercepts the Interstate 29, County Road 81, um, and the BNSF Railroad. Uh, for the engineers in the room, north is to the left on the drawing, so just so you get oriented right. Um, but anyway, this is, so this is a unique area. We've got four different structures within about 500 feet of each other. All need to be replaced. All the roads need to be maintained and left open. The road and the railroad need to be maintained and left open, and this when you look at the timing of all the work that needs to go on here, this became very quickly one of the biggest um, factors in meet, meeting schedule on the project was getting this particular spot completed. So to give you a little idea, um, so right now, just the, the highlights that are going up, that shows that, that there's the interstate traffic uh, on its existing alignment. Um, then County Road 81 is on the east edge. So that's two-way traffic that's running um, cars. And then in between those two is the BNSF Railroad that, uh, that carries rail traffic between Fargo and Grand Forks. Um, so since we have to keep all of these facilities working, um, we, uh, there will be bypasses built. So the, the one you're showing there uh, in the south, on the westerly side is the Interstate 29 bypass. Um, that then allows, once the traffic's bypassed, allows you to work on the interstate and rebuild the bridges. On the east edge, then there'll be a bypass for the county road. Again, allows us to shut the county road off and, and get that construction underway. And then in between the interstate and the railroad, they're planning to build a railroad shoe fly to detour rail traffic. So there'll be four bridges being built in here with live traffic on either side of, of all of them. And uh, so a lot, a lot of coordination, a lot of interaction that needs to happen. I think one thing, Jason, I don't know if you want to elaborate on this a little bit, but Jason reminded me that, you know, of all three of these agencies, they all have different design and construction standards. And so we got three different, four different bridges going in within 500 feet of each other based on one set of technical requirements, but three different agencies that regulate that. And they all have their own collaboration and their own way of building things that we're trying to nest all together at one time. So I don't know if there's yeah. anything you want to add to that. But. I think you covered it well, Chris. And, and like he said, this is really one of those linchpin points on the project because you know, diff as we've gone through the, the various iterations on this, there's been estimates that this could take five years just to construct all of this. Well, 
we're going to have the project done by the fall of 2026. So we got four and a half years. So um, this is going to be a fast, uh, fast moving project to get all this in. And, and like Chris said, just the coordination between the different design standards with the different agencies and, you know, things like, you know, a, an extra foot rise on an extra foot rise on the BNSF bridge. How much does that cause a grade raise going north and south on the road tracks? So, um, you know, those are the types of things that we're looking at. We have to look at and be cognizant of. So once the once the new structures are built and the roads are reconstructed and obviously the bypasses will be deconstructed, all of the all of the feet, all of the the three different uh, entities will all have their uh, their systems reestablished on the existing alignments. So there's no additional curvatures or, or realignments done in the permanent condition. So again, one of the more critical items, and it's 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 on the north end of the project, which which helps in that it gets uh, that's the area they're planning to start in anyway. Um, one other area that we wanted to focus on is uh, is kind of ties drainage and, and highways and, and our project all together. Uh, this is down along the 94 area of, of our channel project. And uh, the, the drain that runs through here is, is the Casco and the Water Resource District Drain 14. Um, it, it carries a bulk of water from the south part and during flooding it also is the Kind of JC, you put it as the mixing pool, right? This is where this is where you get Maple River water breaking out by Mapleton. You get you get uh, Cheyenne River water breaking out down by Kindred, and everything kind of is working its way north, and it gets all clogged up right here at the interstate. And, and so one of the one of the points that's probably the least the most restrictive is right at the interstate to try to get water through. So as a part of our project. Um, we agreed with the Water Resource District, collaborated with them on are there ways we can make improvements here to the overall drainage of the area. And, and the idea was that we would establish and actually build a second connection channel for drain 14 directly into our diversion channel that's south of the interstate. So that essentially breaks off a vast majority of the drainage and brings it directly to the diversion channel without having to have it cross the interstate. And that provides great benefits to long term on the interstate side, they'd be able to replace the bridges that are there with much smaller structures in the future. Um, also, it just prevents that water from mashing up against the interstate and, and causing a lot of localized problems during during flood events as well. Um, so one then adding on to top of that, um, the county was also planning on doing a project and I'll let Jason explain kind of the county's ties to to this whole this whole event on, uh, on yes. Cass County 15. Uh, so Cass County 15, the road that heads uh, south of Kindred, um, bridge that's there right now is a, a very narrow bridge. And so it, it overtops during most large flood events and there's no good detour because it's the closest, uh, it, or there isn't a close uh, other paved road. So you basically have to go south about six miles to get to the next paved road. Uh, to connect over to uh, and then basically you're heading east all the way to I-29. Uh, so we wanted to get this a bridge replaced, get it out of the water so that we've got uh, you know permanent access during a flood uh, for all the local people that are uh, traveling in that area. And then as part of the, the breakout flows that Chris had mentioned from the Cheyenne and Maple, we've never been able to have a good gauge of what those flows are because with the bridge being overtopped, we don't have a permanent uh, USGS gauge at that location. So usually the USGS has to put on the waders and throw out their portable buoy system to monitor the flows. Uh, so we're gonna build this new bridge, widen it, lengthen it. It's gonna hydraulically, uh, we're, we're raising it up so it'll handle all the new flows uh, or all the flows coming from those tributary breakouts. And then working with USGS, we'll be putting a new stream gauge monitoring site on the bridge. So that'll give us a better idea of those flows coming into the project, which helps out with the diversion project itself, because we have to have a total understanding of all of the inflows coming into the diversion channel, not just what's coming in on the, the red and the wild rice south of town, but also what's on the, on the Cheyenne, the Maple River, the Rush, Lower Rush, and these critical uh, critical other uh, legal drains. Um, so yeah, with, with that, uh, the, the original P3 project had a 
uh, drop structure where the channel working with the water resource districts, the, the water resource district know that in the future, they're gonna do some sort of drain reconstruction and that may include doing some lowering of the drain. So we had in our, in, or in our P3 uh, proposal, the, uh, uh, this drop structure to be able to allow the, the water resource districts to tie into it in the future. With our bridge project, we thought it doesn't make sense to build this bridge having a lack of, of uh, flow through it. And then five years later, if the water resource districts comes and redoes, re reconstructs their drain and lowers it, now we have to re reconstruct everything underneath the bridge. So we shifted the, the uh, drop structure to the west side of the bridge. We're gonna construct that bridge to have the full capacity. So that way, five, 10 years down the road when the water resource districts needs that capacity, it's there. And they just have to pull that, that uh, drop structure out on the west side. So again, this is where you know, the discussions that Chris and I, the water resource districts, other agencies are having uh, to make sure that we're building a better project that's looking not just what's in the next two to five years, but you know, a lot further down the road. Thanks, Jason. So one other area that was a little bit unique, <clears throat> this is further south. This is down on the south edge of, of Horace. Horus is what you see on the, the top right portion of the drawing. Um, so in this area of our channel construction, there's a, again, Jason has a County Road, County Road 14 that runs east and west from the interstate, uh, west of County Road 15, uh, the Kindred Road. And then also there's a, a local rail line that ran into Horus, used to run all the way into Fargo, but now it just, it ends in Horus at an elevator there. Um, as we were doing our preliminary planning for the diversion project, uh, there's been conversations I remember back 10 years or more uh, people just made passing comments that hey that rail line doesn't get used much does it really make sense to build a bridge uh, you know multi-million dollar bridge across the channel that may, may just hardly get used so uh, a little over almost two years ago a uh, year and a half ago we struck up a conversation we started with the elevator and Horace and just asked him hey what, what's your long-term plan where are you guys at? We also then struck up conversations with the Red River Valley Western Railroad and, and through a series of conversations led to, hey, you know what, I think, I, I think we could figure something out here to eliminate the bridge across the channel. So we're in the process right now of, of purchasing the elevator, purchasing the rail line between the elevator and the channel. Um, and we've been able to eliminate the bridge across the channel. Uh, it also gave us an ability then to realign County Road 14 a little bit. The, the, the loops you see there were really driven by trying to get as perpendicular as we could to the rail crossing as we, as we cross that. So we have, we have some flexibility now and, and hopefully making the, the highway crossing there even more efficient. So one other area of collaboration on something that's completely outside of our typical construction, but it, it's been a great conversation. I think it's a long-term win-win for everybody, the city, for us. Uh, for the for the railroad and the elevators, we've been able to to get them, make them whole, and keep them running their operations, and probably even make their systems more efficient as we as we get them uh, some storage and some other places where it's a little little easier to use in the egg side of things. The last area that we wanted to talk about collaboration is is kind of the 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 connector spot, if you will, between all the different programs. So this is down in the very south end of the channel and the beginning of the core project. So the structure that you see in the middle of the map is the diversion inlet structure. That's what lets water into our diversion channel. Corps of Engineers is building that. It's actually scheduled to be done um, in a year or so. Um, so that, that project was the first project the Corps, the Corps let, and it's been the earliest project and the project at the furthest along. But it also then creates the spot where our channel has to connect to it. It also happens to be right at the intersection of two of Jason's major county roads. Uh, so I'll maybe let him talk through a little bit of the collaboration on how we're reconnecting county roads 16 and 17 down in that area. And then how we're also getting the channel and the coordination between the, now the two major parts of our program, not just within collaborating within the, within the individual components. All right, yeah, thanks Chris. So um, you can see on the aerial image, there's a north-south road that's got a, a curve in it, and that's our County Road 17. We had to build that little curve bypass around what the core uh, construction project was when they started their 
inlet, uh, inlet structure project. Um, but we need to make this connection. So we've added in a roundabout on Country Road 15 that'll connect up and over. So east of the roundabout will go up and over an embankment, and then it'll connect back into our existing Country Road 16, as well as have a T intersection to head south on Country Road 17. That project is now rolled into with the Corps of Engineers includes all the way up to uh, the, the project limits for the P3. So that'll be constructed. And of course, the, just the construction timing, we still have north, north south traffic uh, and east west traffic as we're building these uh, connections. Then the P3, uh, as part of the, the uh, RFP, the construction, uh, to get that the bridge and the tie-ins uh, on their on the embankment for the diversion channel itself, that's got to get completed as well as the tie-ins to the north with our County Road 17, and all of, all of the rest of this uh, uh, transportation network gets shut down because we're also having to coordinate with you know law enforcement, EMS, uh, rural fire. If we shut this corridor down for more than a few months, it becomes you know, a, a big challenge on how EMS and public safety officials can get to an emergency down in the nest in the sort of, uh, of Cass County. So uh, huge collaboration to make sure that between the core, the P3 and all the local entities and, and, and my county roads themselves uh, that, we're, that we're talking and, and that we have this laid out and, you know, again, building a, a better, um, more efficient project. Thanks, Jason. Um, real quick, I know we got to wrap up here. Um, just want to jump ahead and show you a couple of, I promised I'd show you some pictures of the, of the aqueduct structures. Uh, just to give you a quick update on kind of where the project stands today. Um, for those that were at the conference last year, I gave an update of where we were. We were right in the middle of our procurement process for the P3. Uh, we have completed that. We have hired a P3 contractor. Uh, we finalized their financial contract um, last October. Uh, we have just given them the authorization here this week to, to initiate their design efforts. Uh, so we're anticipating we'll get inundated with designs here very shortly, and then anticipating that they'll have their construction operations start um, sometime, sometime this summer as they get their first rounds of plans completed. Uh, so we're well underway. Um, if you have questions on kind of where we are on the project, boy, just please come and find Jason or I. We can certainly give you an update. But real quick, this, this is what the aqueduct structure is. So as you look from left to right, that's the diversion channel. Um, this is, I think, the, the uh, Cheyenne River aqueduct. Uh, it, they, they're very similar. Uh, but the, the reality is the diversion channel is actually lower than the river channels in these areas. So um, to keep the rivers connected, we actually have to build basically a box culvert with a, with a structure sitting on top of it. So the, the uh, river water will naturally flow kind of um, north to south or top to bottom across the top of the structure. And then as we operate our project, we'll run water underneath it through the diversion channel. Um, these are set up um, very, very sophisticated structures um, in that the structure itself is simple, but how we monitor flows, we've, we've set these to only allow enough flow to go across into the protected area that so we don't inundate, inundate the city. So there's weir structures that you don't see here that essentially when you get to those maximum flows, it lets water drop directly into our channel. So we've been able to eliminate a, a, a lot of coordination on, with the cities by having these structures really monitor the flows and regulate the flows coming in and out of town. So with that, um, well, I again, want to thank, thank Jason for bringing me into his presentation and uh, um, thanks for allowing us some time today to give you guys an update on the collaboration we've been doing with, uh, with the diversion project. So from a scale perspective, that's how, that's how big the structure is. If you look at the people on the, on the walkway, these are definitely not small structures. To kind of, since we're on transportation, I'd end with a quick rendering of kind of, the, this is what the interstate bridges will look like. Um, uh, either on I-29 or I-94. So with that, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.
Chris, I, Chris, I think you said undersell and over deliver and wow, I have way undersold you guys. That was fantastic. Hey, I'm from Federal Highway and I'm here to help. What do you think of that statement? I think it's so true. I'm from the DOT and I'm here to help. I'm from Upper Great Plains, I'm here to help. I'm from the AGC, I'm here to help. I'm one of the consulting engineer leads, I'm here to help. I'm a supplier, I'm here to help. That's what the collaboration, the partnership, that's just been the total platform for this presentation. That's what you heard today to make an event, an engineering success like that happens, takes all of us. So kudos to you too, and to the whole team that put the project together, the diversion, diversion project, absolutely amazing. So how many people here are drinking energy drinks? By show of hands, any energy drinks? Thank goodness, because there's a whole lot more learning yet today <laughs> and I don't want any heads exploding. <laughs> but to make, before we get to the next breakout session, we've got a great opportunity, our last great opportunity to spend time with our exhibitors in Hall B. So 1020, come back to breakout sessions. Until then, spend time, thank your exhibitors, learn from them, let's tap into each other. I'm from Federal Highway, I'm here to help. Thank you.